Welcome to the Insurgents Podcast with Frank Viola. And he's brought a friend. This is the podcast that supplements Frank's groundbreaking book, Insurgents, Reclaiming the Gospel of the Kingdom, which is shaking up the Christian world. You can find out details about the book at insurgents.org. Sit back, open all four ears, physical and spiritual, and join the insurgents. Here's Frank. Welcome to another edition of the Insurgents Podcast. We are going through every reference to the kingdom of God in the New Testament. We are in the Gospel of Luke. And the next reference is found in Luke chapter 18. And I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. This is in the midst of the discourse that Jesus had with the rich young ruler, which begins in verse 18. We're going to pick up in verse 22. When Jesus heard his answer, he said, there is still one thing you haven't done. And this is when the rich young ruler asked Jesus, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus answered, you know the commandments. Mm. Do not commit adultery, murder, steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And then the man said, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. And then in verse 22, when Jesus heard this, he said, There is still one thing you haven't done. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when the man heard this, he became very sad, for he was very rich. And in one of the other Gospels, we're told that Jesus looked at him and loved him. Mm -hmm. which is interesting. There was something special about this man in the Lord's eyes. It's possible that Jesus saw in him a call, a divine call to the apostolic work. It's very possible. Anyway, verse 24, when Jesus saw this, he said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this said, Then who in the world can be saved? <laughs> he replied, What is impossible for people is possible with God. Peter said, this is verse 28, We've left our homes to follow you. Yes, Jesus replied, And I assure you that everyone who has given up house or wife or brothers, or parents, or children, for the sake of the kingdom of God, will be repaid many times over in this life, and will have eternal life in the world to come. And that's how the passage ends. Now, I want to say this to our listening audience. We covered the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10 in episode 87. And that episode is called Jesus Challenges the Rich. However, in this episode, we're going to concentrate on verses 24 to verse 30, which is a follow-up at the end of the story, and the kingdom of God is mentioned in verse 29. And that's why we're looking at it here. I will default to Jared to start us off. Again, this is one of those passages that it's hard to read. Because when we read it, it's challenging for how we view things. And it would have been really challenging for the people at that time. Because as we've talked about before, uh, you know, wealth was seen as God's blessing. And so Jesus is telling, you know, them that it's hard for the wealthy who in that culture's minds have received God's blessing to come into the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the things. And in this passage, you and I chatted about just a few minutes ago, the camel through the eye of the needle. That's been something that commentators have tried to to sanitize some. You know, they, they say, well, there was this one gate that they had to have a camel, you know, kneel in order to get through. And they called it the eye of the needle. There's no evidence for that at this time. That was something that came along later and was probably created because of this passage. Or the idea that, well, in the one version in the, I think the Peshetta, the Aramaic version, it's rope. Well, the idea here, though, is there's an impossibility. The idea, if you say a rope can go through the eye of a needle, you know, 
I don't think you would have, or they had that needle gate. I don't think you would have the response. Who could then be saved? You know, the idea here is yes. the impossibility yep. of humanity, and part of that has to do with the rich did not have to depend on God in that culture. Mm-hmm. You know, when when we are well off, we don't have to worry about you know existential things as much we don't have to worry about well where is our next meal going to come from we do not have to depend on god's blessing and i think that's part of what jesus is getting at that if you're rich that's going to hold you back because you're going to lean on to that as a strength and lean on to the blessings of god instead of lean on to god himself mm-hmm. yeah what really arrests me is the latter part where mm. Peter says, you know, we've left our houses to follow you. And what the Lord says to him is that you will receive reward, not just in the age to come because you followed me mm. and forsaken all and followed me, yeah. but also in this age. And he specifically says, if you've left houses, you will receive houses. If you have forsaken family members, because the gospel comes, the kingdom comes as a sword. And as Jesus said, it often divides family members. If you've lost brothers and sisters or parents or even a spouse because of the kingdom and its message and you receiving it, you will receive more of these things. In Mark, here's how he puts it. I assure you, this is chapter 10, verse 29, I assure you that everyone has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property along with persecution. (laughs) (laughs) Now the fulfillment of this, I believe clearly and strongly, it's not a promise that if you've forsaken these things that now you're going to receive mansions and fancy cars and lots of money in the bank <laughs> which according to the prosperity gospel that's one of their proof texts no he's talking about the fact that you will inherit an extended family and all the possessions that are in that extended family will be shared among the brothers and sisters This is exactly what happened in Acts chapter 2. The ecclesia in Jerusalem and all those 12 disciples were part of it, minus Judas. They shared all of their possessions. They took care of one another. There were brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, spiritually, Mm -hmm. right? It was the ecclesia. It was the community of the king. And I have experienced this in my own life on two occasions, actually three, three occasions, where I had the privilege of being part of an ecclesia where there were brothers and sisters, spiritual fathers and mothers. Many of us, not all of us, owned homes, some rented, and we were able to take care of each other. And we were able to share what we had. And so, for example, some of the single brothers in some of these fellowships couldn't afford to buy a house. Mm -hmm. So some of the families took them in and they lived with them. And sometimes they would move from one house to another. Well, what is that? That's the multiplication of houses. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Some of us had lawnmowers. We'd share those lawnmowers. Mm -hmm. Some of us had tools to work on our homes and our yards shared those. Sometimes there was a brother or sister in the church who had a medical issue and could not drive. And so we would have a schedule and different brothers and sisters were on duty to to go ahead and take that person to their medical appointments and other appointments or to the grocery store. It was the multiplication of family members Mm. because we had left all to follow Christ And in so doing, one of the rewards in this life was an inherited, extended family. Mm -hmm. And that's what the ecclesia is to be. And even though the churches in Corinth and Thessalonica and Ephesus 
did not have this commune that the early church in Jerusalem had where they sold all of their possessions and took care of one another and shared amongst themselves. They did have this community life where they were sharing possessions even though they owned their own mm -hmm. homes, etc. Right? Oh, yeah. And that's what we did on those three occasions. And it was beautiful. And when people would come to visit us, most of the time other Christians and part of different churches, they couldn't believe what they were seeing. Mm -hmm. Because they'd never seen anything like it. And even the churches that they belonged to yeah. didn't function like this. Yeah. Most of the people that they knew in those churches, they hardly, they hardly had a knew. personal relationship with. Yeah. Right. So this was incredible. And for us, it was body life. The yes. life of the body of Christ. Ecclesia life. And I talk about it in an old book I wrote many years ago called Reimagining Church. Mm -hmm. And that book did not just come out of my reading of the New Testament and New Testament scholars, etc. It came out of my own experience. Mm -hmm. But this, I am convinced of what Jesus was talking about. Now, if a person has never had that experience, one of the best examples I can give to give you an image of what he's talking about when he says, you will receive now in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, property, etc., along with persecution, you can think of high school cliques. You can think of city gangs where people belong and they have each other's backs. Yeah. Now, of course, the cliques could be very dysfunctional, but and, I'm talking yeah. about those that are really tight and they take mm -hmm. care of each other. They stand for one another. This is what the ecclesia is supposed to was be. Yeah. and is in its best form. Mm -hmm. But the church as the New Testament envisions it is what I believe the Lord was talking about here. Not many mansions, many cars, lots of money in the bank. He's talking about the pride and joy of his own heart, his bride, in practical expression. I love that the, the thinking through family members, extended families, and you talk about mothers and fathers in Christ and, and brothers and sisters. And I think back through my life and and I have those spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers that invested in me and, mm -hmm. and viewing it that way and understanding that they understood what they were doing, like that they took on that responsibility. Um, and that's something that, that is missing in a lot of, oh, a lot of places within Christianity and that idea of, well, we share things, you know. I find it always interesting when you know when we try to show some any sort of hospitality to people in in our community it's it's looked at as weird and even in the church community we'll show up you know someone is having a rough time and so my wife her love language is um, food you know when whenever people come to visit us her mission is to make sure they gain at mm -hmm. least a couple pounds if they're there for a weekend <laughs> um, and she's never not been successful with that but for her, when she hears someone has got some things going on and they're having a rough time or there's sickness or there's you know something going on, her first deal is, how can I help? And I would like to make your life easier. And mm -hmm. so let me prepare something for you. Mm -hmm. And that's not something people in, this, in our culture get very often, but that's something that you do in a community. You take care of each other. You look out for each other and you live it out. We had... He actually um, just passed, but one we had a parishioner in our church that wasn't doing well and wasn't eating. And my wife find, found out that whenever she made him bread and took it over, he ate that stuff up. So mm. she got really good at making bread mm. because she under she wanted to do something for that. You know that that was that that's what family does. I think mm. those are little things, but we need more of that. You know. Mm. Because we are more and more separating. So that idea of, of being together, being the ecclesia, being that spiritual connection, it, it, it's needed there. As you read Mark, I think it kind of comes back to what we've been talking about as Jesus is the kingdom, right? The totality of the kingdom. In Mark, he says, whenever you give these things up for my sake... And here, it's for the sake of the kingdom of God. There you go. Beautiful. Like, I mean, it's, it's the connection. same thing. So Interchangeable. Yeah. Yes. Amen. To add to what you were saying about family, extended family, the dominating metaphor in the New Testament for the church is not the body mm -hmm. of Christ. It's not the bride. 
It's the family mm. of God. Mm. It's the yes. household of God. You have family language peppered all throughout Paul's epistles. We come into this family through a birth, a new birth. We inherit brothers and sisters. He's constantly using that term that refers to brothers and sisters. Brethren, sistren. He doesn't use sistren, but you can <laughs> throw that in there because Adelphoi means brothers and sisters. He talks about the family of God, the household of God. He talks about mothers, fathers, right? You have the imagery of family all throughout the New Testament, and it is a family in the New Testament now that is thicker than blood. Mm, yes. Because often blood relatives are depicted as a competitor mm -hmm. to the kingdom, and that's why Jesus often says, Love me more than your family members. Well, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Yeah, another example. Exactly. Perfect. So you have a lot of that in the New Testament. And sell all that you own and follow me is what he said to the rich young ruler. And then what Peter says is we have left what is ours and followed you. So Peter did what the rich young mm -hmm. ruler was asked to do. I don't have a problem with Peter asking the question. Uh, mm. I mean, it's human, you know. Okay, mm -hmm. so what, what are we going to get out of this? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's human, all right. But I love the fact that Jesus answered him. He didn't rebuke him for the no. question. He said, you are going to receive a reward in the next life, but also in this life. And mm -hmm. the ecclesia of God, as she's envisioned in the New Testament, that is one of the most beautiful experiences a person can have because we're built for it. Mm. We're built for community. And yeah. if you have Christ in you, there is an instinct to be with brothers and sisters. Even if you're an introvert, mm -hmm. there's still that spiritual instinct to meet together and to have a shared life with other brothers and sisters. And there's nothing like it. And in fact, I would say you can't live the Christian life properly without that community. No, you can't. I mean, you, you can't follow the command to Jesus without the community. Well, well, exactly. And to your point, when you said in our last episode, the yous, Y-O-U, is usually plural. Mm -hmm. So when Paul's writing to a church, say, the Thessalonians, the Corinthians, the Colossians, he's not writing to individuals. The mm -hmm. yous there are plural. plural yeah. He's talking about you all. Yeah. And so how can I apply that Unless I'm connected with other brothers and sisters. Yeah. Now, the sad thing is we're living in a season right now, at the time of this recording, God willing, it will change soon, where it's very hard to find Christians who are interested enough to pay the price to have community the way we're talking about. Yeah. Now, I've had the experience three times over the years, thank God, and I've helped others have it, but we're living in a season at this moment where if you can find two Christians that say, yeah, we want to have shared life mm -hmm. and they're willing to do it and pay the price to have it, you are a rare person. Because right now there are many, many Christians looking for it. They cannot find it. Well, before, before I came um, up here, um, I was talking to someone who is connected with this podcast, who listens to the podcast, has read some of your stuff. And one of the questions he had for me is, do you get to experience that much? Those sort of connections, that sort of thing that we see in the ecclesia, and um, I was I was real honest. Like, I find some of that sometimes, but it is usually just in you know just in pockets. Pockets, yep. yep. And and so and you have to and part of it is you have to invest in that, and sometimes when you invest in that, the other person or the other parties end up not wanting that. Yeah, and so it's a, it's difficult to find that's that, what makes it, that's and you what makes it hard. Yep. you've you've got to work for it. So yeah, very good. As you said, many commentators have tried to dilute and soften this word by saying the camel going through the eye of a needle is not really a camel, <laughs> and some say it was this gate that uh, the camels went through mm -hmm. called the eye of the needle and all that and that all has been debunked mm -hmm. by many many scholars and historians he was saying that what is impossible with humans which is salvation <laughs> is only possible with god mm -hmm. and i can mm -hmm. resonate with that i mean as one 
person said God's mercy got stretched to the absolute limits of its fabric when he saved me mm. and when he saved you <laughs> mm. and he can stretch that fabric of mercy to reach others who are lost as lost as you can imagine so salvation really is a miracle and as I put it in a book we're all hanging from a cobweb of grace and mercy. <laughs> and if you don't believe that, then you do not understand your own fallenness. <laughs> yes. Nor the holiness of God and yes. the bounty of God's grace. Mm. The other point I want to make is that, again, echoing what you said, the rich in that day were regarded as spiritual, pious, generous, being blessed by God, being favored by God. And here, Jesus, and what he said to this rich young man, he turned it upside down on mm -hmm. his head. And by the way, where I'm getting a rich young ruler, you have to combine the, the story on all the other Gospels because each one gives you a different detail about this particular person. And now the disciples, they were not elite. They were professionals. You know, they had fishermen, tax gatherers. They were not poor but they had abandoned their economic security to follow the Lord. And I like that Jesus said, you will be rewarded not just in the afterlife where you're storing up treasure in the heavenly places, but mm -hmm. also in this Here, life yeah. through this the community of the king. Yeah. But I love how Jesus blew up this idea that the rich were in with God, tight with God, just because they were blessed with wealth. And the other point I want to make is that salvation is by faith. It's a free gift. But the kingdom, which is a synonym for salvation, by the way, mm -hmm. although a gracious gift, is costly. And it may cost you, listener, earthly possessions, friends, family members, and even your own life. And I'm not just talking about martyrdom. I'm talking about laying your life down. Mm -hmm desires, dreams, wishes, etc. Forsaking all is a demand of the kingdom. It just yeah. is. And I think with this rich man, Jesus was probing that one area, but he loved more than God. That one area that was hindering him from following the Lord. That one area that he was holding back. And it was his love of money. Mm. It was his love of wealth. And that, that was his God. Exactly. One of my questions as I look at this passage and think about, well, what do we do with this is, what is, what is my wealth? Mm. You know, what is the thing that, that I struggle to give up that if God said, okay, you need to jettison that from your life, I would be very sad. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's an important question to say, okay, it may not be wealth for everyone because, you know, we may not feel like that's a, a thing but we all have those things that they will get in the way of us following jesus if we don't make him first that idea of of um you know going all in and just saying okay we're putting it all we're not holding anything back right it's all on the table and it's all for god that is the question that we should end with for all of us I am quite sure that this young man who asked this question to Jesus, this wealthy, rich person, I'm quite sure that he never considered that he loved his wealth and possessions mm -hmm. more than God Yeah. until Jesus said, sell it all. Mm. And I think that's true for, for all of us. We probably are not in touch with any idols we may have, that which we are cling on to above the Lord Jesus Christ until we're asked to give it up. Mm. So that's something that we would leave yeah. all of you with. It may not be money for you. It may yeah. not be wealth. It could be something else. It could be a person mm. yeah, in I mean, your life. Right? I mean, it could be your family life. Even. Right? How right. do you deal with that? You know, what is your first priority? And what's the promise? If you will sell all forsake all and follow me, not only in the afterlife will you be storing up treasure in heaven, but you will be rewarded with. Mm -hmm. Same thing with friends. I remember one of the early lessons I learned in my Christian walk 
came when I started following the Lord at 16. I had a group of friends. None of them were following Christ. Mm -hmm. The Lord was asking me to give up those friendships. And it was difficult because, you know, on a Friday night, a Saturday night, these were the guys I hung out with. Mm -hmm. And we had fun and it was a lot of laughter and so forth. And of course, I shared the Lord with them. But at the time, they were not interested. Now, one of them came to the Lord like 30 years later, Mm -hmm. (laughs) interestingly enough. So I gave them up and I had no friends for a time. But then the Lord opened a door, connected me with Mm. another young man, one year younger, who was following Christ. And we developed a beautiful relationship. Mm -hmm. And it was better than the relationships I had before. So there's another message on the Christ is All podcast that I would encourage you to listen to that goes along with this. It's called, He Takes Away That He May Establish. And the principle is that God will take away the first in order to give you the second, and the second is always better. And it's a principle that runs throughout the biblical story, both Old and New Testament. So we will leave you with that question to bring to the Lord and ask Him to probe your heart. And whatever he demands, he gives you the grace to fulfill. Within every command of Jesus, inherent in it is a promise that he will empower you to carry it out. Amen. Therefore, the demands of Jesus and the commands of Jesus are all promises. Mm -hmm. Because whatever he asks of us, he himself will do it. If we allow him to. Yes. We'll see you in the next episode. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the Insurgents Podcast and give it a five-star review on iTunes. This will help others find it. Also, you can join Frank's unfiltered email list at frankviola.org and receive encouragement, challenges, and insights connected to the gospel of the kingdom. Remember, the Insurgents has begun. Don't miss it.